All right, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm here, I'm on, I'm not hearing. Morning, 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 testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three, there we go. I think we're on. All right, let's uh, grab a seat and let's get started this morning. All right, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this week that we've had to worship you, to to live for you. Uh, we uh, we want to come before your word and in fellowship with each other and uh, just uh, wrestle with your word and to help us better understand who you are. Uh, in your salvation, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I think somebody last week asked about the snack list, um, and I, so I just left it on the back because I guess it didn't go all the way around last time. Um, so it's on the back counter. We're good through January at least, So, but towards the end of the quarter, there's a few spots there. Um, I put my email on the handouts now just in case you have questions or comments. Um, last week I shared some um, funny student comments in my essay papers that I grade over the years. Um, I'm going to share a couple, a few more. Um, the author has a degree, a master's in divination. <laughs> I don't know where you go for that kind of a degree, but it doesn't Sound like it'd be a nice place to go. Here's a Gospels essay. Jesus' intended audience consisted of prophets, (laughs) P-R-O-F-I-T-S, genitals. Okay, you know what that's supposed to be? Gentiles, yeah. Jews and the rest of God's people. Israel was called to be a matador between God and the nations mediator, I think. One I get all the time is um, in the Gospels, the Gospels class, uh, is they talk about Jesus' temptation in the dessert. <laughs> and I usually write in the column of pie, ice cream, what, you know? <laughs> what is it? And, and it's really relevant to, to uh, Hebrews because in Hebrews 2 and 4, we talked about that, how Jesus took on flesh and became like us and then it says he, he was tempted in every way just as we are, right? So tempted in the dessert. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're kind of, this is a two-parter we're working on from uh, chapter 6 of Hebrews, kind of struggling through um, Hebrews 6, 4 and following. I'm going to go ahead and read that again. It is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away since on their own they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt or public disgrace in the NIV. Um, Ground that drinks up the rain, falling on it repeatedly, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and on the verge of being cursed. Its end is to be burned over. So we kind of left it there last week, um, but I do want to read the next section um, because that's very important. Even though we speak in this way, beloved, (laughs) We are confident of better things in your case, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints, as you still do. And we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end, so that you may not become sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. 
So that word sluggish there is kind of a bookend because the beginning of this passage in 5.10 talked about, you know, when he stops all of a sudden and says, okay, I can't talk about Melchizedek yet. You guys are sluggish. Um, and so he has this little exhortation parenthesis here in this section. And, and at the end, he, he re-mentions this word so you may not become uh, sluggish there. So we looked at that serious warning uh, in chapter 6, 4 through 6 in particular, and it seems to be, I mean, if you look kind of in the context of the whole letter, um, that there's a, a problem with kind of a gradual drifting or moving away from the faith. And so the, the author all the way through the book kind of uses this progressive uh, system of admonitions, be careful not to drift away. Okay, so it's like a sailing metaphor, right, where the ship's kind of just gradually going off, and maybe you don't even notice. Uh, be careful not to ignore. Be careful not to turn away. Be careful not to fall short. Uh, be careful not to spurn the Son of God. So chapter 10 is very close to our passage in chapter 6 here. Uh, be careful not to abandon. And be careful not to shrink back. I mean, you read through the whole letter, they're just constantly warning them, uh, and exhorting them about what direction they're going in their faith. So when we talk about these, this particular difficult passage, um, we didn't get a chance last week. I had some of these passages on your worksheet, but uh, what I did this week is I, I put those same passages on, but then I put some contrasting passages um, because here we're talking about issues on which Christians really <laughs> disagree about particular interpretations of, of things. And so it's good to see both sides of it. Jesus said, truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. For, Mark says, they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, Matthew and Luke have that little story, but only Mark, who's the earliest gospel, has this little phrase, for they were saying, or in your translations, it probably says they said, but in the Greek, it's an imperfect, and it's kind of a past action which has ongoing results, right? So it's not just that they said he has an unclean spirit. They were saying this. This is a continuous kind of attitude to who Jesus was and to his preaching and to the kingdom of God. And, uh, and of course, we, you know, we opened last week with the question, how, how do we interpret this? Um, and there are some early Christian interpretations of that passage. The earliest one we have is in a book called the Didache. It's, a, it's called The Teaching of the Twelve. And it's very early. Some of it is as early as, as the Gospels that we have. It actually uses some of Matthew. Uh, and it has kind of a, a different tr interpretation. It says, um, and so we're talking about a time period in where there are, um, itinerant uh, apostles and prophets and teachers and so on, you know, going from church to church, doing their little gifts there. And the Didache says, do not test or examine any prophet who is speaking in a spirit, for every sin shall be forgiven, but this sin shall not be forgiven. Okay, well, Paul would have an issue with that because Paul twice in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Thessalonians 5 specifically says to test prophets, to test prophecy, to see if they're true or not. So, uh, so I don't think that's really what is meant in the passage. And what I would always say is, look, if somebody says, you know, I'm concerned that I committed the unpardonable sin, well, I think that's good enough uh, evidence that you didn't commit it. If you're concerned about it, Okay, because then you're concerned to, to be close to the Lord, to, be, to, um, to understand who he is, to accept him. So now the other passage there below that, those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Um, so that's a passage in the Gospels that seems to influence some later uh, passages as well. Now, on the other side of that, Jesus in John um, talks about those who come to faith and that uh, no one can take them out of his hand. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. 
I give eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. Now, there he's talking about the disciples, and, uh, and of course, we have a little issue there because one of them did not last, did he? Judas. Um, and then in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of the heavens. I put the literal Greek there because Matthew often has plural heavens. Uh, will enter the kingdom of the heavens. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Okay, so that little passage in chapter 7 prepares for chapter 25 where you have the sheep and the goats parable. And people say, Lord, Lord, you know, didn't we do this in your name? And he says, what? Who are you? <laughs> I don't know who you are. All right. So there can be people who claim to be believers uh, who do things in Jesus' name uh, who are not authentic. Paul, in 2 Timothy, if we've died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So you notice the difference there between denial and faithlessness, right? Those two very different things. Um, and, and we'll talk about this at the end, about God's covenant faithfulness. Um, but Peter, of course, we know, we know that story in the Gospels where Peter says, and I put it on your sheet there, he says, write to Jesus, I will never deny you. Okay? It's the same word that Paul just used here in 2 Timothy in the Greek. Uh, if we deny him. So is that a permanent condition? Obviously wasn't, was it with Peter? Paul later in Romans 8 says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And really, you could, you could read pretty much all of Romans 5 through 8, um, where Paul talks about assurance of salvation there. Peter, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Okay, so very similar passage to, uh, to Hebrews 6 here, right? Seems to use language that um, understands that these people knew the Lord in some way, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, are again entangled, um, have known the way of righteousness. And yet in the next chapter, uh, 3 of Second Peter, he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you. Okay, He's not talking about unbelievers here. He's, talking, he's writing to believers. He's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. John... Um, 1 John in particular, a lot of uh, discussion in 1 John about assurance. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is a sin and there is a sin that does not lead to death. Okay, what on earth is John talking about here? All right. Um, if you grew up Catholic like I did, then you know this is a very central passage for two different kinds of sins. Does anybody know what they are? Venial and a mortal sin. Okay. So the sin that leads to death would be a mortal sin. Um, a venial sin would be uh, an unconfessed sin 
Uh, and if you die with unconfessed sin in the Catholic uh, understanding, uh, you go where? You know, you don't go to hell. You go to purgatory, all right, which means to purge you of that venial sin, right? If you die with unconfessed mortal sin, where do you go? You go to hell, okay? Well, we'll, we'll talk about First John when we get there. Um, now, a little earlier in the letter, First um, John is dealing with a church split, right? A schism in the early church over who Jesus was, over Jesus in the flesh, okay? So there are people who are part of the co- community of, of faith there who said, well, we don't believe that anymore, so we're going to leave. And it really upset the congregation. And so John says, they went out from us, these people, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us. Okay, so you kind of have this idea that, well, if they would have stayed, they would have shown, you know, that they were part, authentically part of the community and were truly believers. And I'm sure Jeff is going through First John, so he's going to be talking about some of these issues. He's already addressed some of these issues of assurance of salvation and so on. So, um, so you can kind of see both, both sides there. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the influence of, of the Hebrews passage in the early church. And it was, it was a passage that really influenced the issue of church discipline. Um, and here's where we really have to keep in mind kind of the, the context of many of these books in the, in, in the later New, New Testament uh, era. Um, First Peter's dealing a lot with persecution of believers, right? Revelation, very much so. Um, some of the Gospels, Jesus is making statements like, you know, uh, I came to bring a sword, I didn't come to bring peace. And, and what he's saying is that being a Christian in that context and environment is going to bring opposition to you, right? And so Hebrews is the same way. We've talked about this in chapter 10. He talks about how they'd already gone through persecution. And, uh, and so from the end of the first century leading up to the, the fourth century, the beginning of the fourth century, you have various periods in which uh, certain Roman emperors were persecuting Christians to various degrees. And, uh, and so in the face of that growing opposition, you know, the early church is having to deal with people who have denied the faith. And what are you going to do with these people, right? And one of the, um, one of the persecutions is called the, the persecution of Decius. He was the emperor uh, in the mid-200s, I guess it is. And what he would require is that everybody, and Christians in particular, come and, and offer uh, a sacrifice to the pagan gods, to burn incense to the pagan gods and, and to the statue of the emperor, to actually taste the sacrifice, okay? You're, you're partaking now. It's like their communion, right? And then you have to have a certificate signed by two or three people to say that they saw you do this, okay? And... There are various levels here. I mean, there were people or Christians who denied the faith and then just never came back. Okay? There were Christians who, who did the sacrifice and then they wanted to come back and be a part of the church. And the church going, okay, so what are we going to do here? Um, there were Christians who, <laughs> kind of like in the pandemic, uh, people who got fake certificates for... Uh, um, Vaccination, yeah. People got fake certificates that they sacrificed, okay. Uh, yeah, can you sign this for me? Um, and in our, our read, we, they actually discovered some of these certificates in a garbage dump in, in Egypt. It was a very famous garbage dump called Oxyrhynchus. And uh, they, they found all kinds of things. They found little pieces of scriptures with the earliest uh, Gospel of John little you know, section of, of scripture in it. Um, they found a little uh, manuscript of Revelation which has 616 instead of 666, okay, which we'll talk about later. Um, 
So here's, here's one of these certificates. To those in charge of the sacrifices of the village Theodelphia, from Aurelia Bellius, daughter of Pateras, and her daughter Capinus, we have always been constant in sacrificing to the gods. And now too, in your presence, in accordance with the regulations, I have poured libations. Okay, what you would do is you'd pour out some wine, right? And that was something that people did in their houses all the time as part of pagan sacrifice. And now too, in your presence, in accordance with the regulations, I poured out libations and sacrificed and tasted the offerings. And I ask you to certify this for us below. May you continue to prosper. Second hand, we Aurelius Serenus and Aurelius Hermas saw you sacrificing. Sign the thing, right? Third hand, I Hermas certify. Sign it. And then it has the Emperor Gaius. This guy's name is crazy. Emperor Caesar, Gaius, Messius, Quintus, Trajanus, Decius, Pius, Felix, Augustus. It goes on, actually. Um, so what is the church going to do, right? Um, one of the bishops of the North African churches, his name is Cyprian, we have a letter of his in which he writes and says, look, all of us pastors and bishops, we got together and and we had differences of opinion about, you know, how we should accept these people or not. And, uh, but we wrestled with this and we looked at scripture and then we made a little pamphlet and we're going to send it out to the churches. Um, so there's a large number of bishops whom their faith and divine protection has preserved in soundness and safety. We met together and the divine scriptures being brought forward on both sides. We balanced the decision with wholesome moderation. And so he talks about sending out this, this book, okay? So they're, you know, they're, they're not always in agreement. He says, if we reject the repentance of those who have some confidence in a conscience that may be tolerated, at once with their wife and their children whom they kept safe, they were hurriedly by the devil's invitation into heresy and schism. If we don't accept people back, right, where are they going to go? They're going to go to other, other places, other differences, different churches. Um, it means we haven't cared for the wounded sheep, he says. So th those whom a hateful persecution has not destroyed, we ruin by our hardness and inhumanity. But I wonder that some are so obstinate as to think that repentance is not to be granted to the lapsed, or to suppose that pardon is to be denied to the penitent. When it is written, remember whence you have fallen and repent and do the first works. Um, that's in Revelation 2.5. So what happened was is that there were um, various conditions that were put on people for coming back into the church. Um, you actually couldn't take communion until you had repented and, and done certain works of, of repentance. Um, so I, I put a little quote there from Peter of Alexandria. This is during the second major persecution, which is later than the one I've been talking about. But uh, the present canons, canon means just uh, church law, basically, uh, address those who have in the persecution denied the faith and are doing penance. The first canon decrees that those who, after many torments, have sacrificed to the gods, not being able to persevere because of frailty, who have passed three years in penance and another 40 days should be enjoined and they can be admitted into the church, okay? It's like, whoa, <laughs> that's pretty serious, isn't it? Um, this public denial of faith was seen as very, very serious. And, and it develops eventually into, into the Western church idea, the Roman Catholic idea particularly of penance. And the word penance is, is, comes from a Latin word, penitere, uh, you might recognize that because we we send people to what penitentiaries, right? And it, the word just means sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so we send them there to think about how sorry they are for what they did, uh, and to learn computer languages. Um, the seriousness of the warning in Hebrews six, along with a literal interpretation of the impossibility of a second repentance following baptism, led some in the church to promote a rigorous form of Christian perfectionism. 
which did not allow for ongoing moral lapses. Theoretically, repentance was understood as a one-time confession, renunciation of sin at baptism, not a repeatable event. Okay, so in the early church, it was, it, they really wrestled with this idea that, well, what do these people, what do we do with these people? Do we rebaptize them? No, that doesn't make any sense. Because, I mean, like our, our passage in Hebrews says, you know, it's, it'd be like re-crucifying Christ again, wouldn't it? Because when you're baptized, you're going down in the water, you're crucified with Christ, and you're resurrected with him. Do we repeat that whole thing? Okay, so they, they really struggled with that idea. Practically, however, the church was faced with the reality that believers continued to struggle with temptation and sin, which led to the eventual development of a threefold pattern of penance. Okay, repentance, you change your mind, it's very biblical. Oral confession, usually then in the Catholic tradition, you'd confess to a priest. Uh, and then the third and the last part of it is works of satisfaction, okay? You're, you're restoring yourself and your relationship. And like John the Baptist said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. So there's a quote there from Clement of Alexandria. So this is during the earlier period. Those who fall into sin after baptism are those who are subjected to discipline. For the deeds done before baptism are remitted in baptism. However, those committed after baptism are purged through discipline. Hmm. Okay, well, that's kind of different. Uh, baptism forgives all your sins, but then what happens to those sins afterwards, right? So this was really batted around quite a bit in the early church. And so when we're looking at a passage like this, uh, as I talked about last week, letters are occasional, right? They're written for specific occasions. And we always have to kind of keep that in mind and not pull these texts out of their original context. Um, one of the early writers, um, an early prophet, his name is Hermas. Um, and he's, his books, <laughs> they go on and on forever. They're in a section of early Christian literature called the Apostolic Fathers. And some people thought that this should have been in our New Testament, the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, it's actually in one canon list, and uh, it's actually in one of the oldest manuscripts that we have on which our New Testaments are based. The manuscript is called Sinaiticus. Um, so anyway, Hermas is having these visions and discussions with an angel, and, and he said, I've heard, sir, and now he's talking to this revelatory angel, said I, from some teachers, that there is no second repentance beyond the one given when we went down into the water and received remission from our father's sins. No second repentance. Gee, what passage could he be referring to here? Hebrews 6. He, the angel, said to me, you have heard correctly, for that is so. For he who has received remission of sin ought never to sin again, but to live in purity. A little later, but see, sir, said I, they have repented with all their heart. I know, said he, that they have repented with all their heart. Do you think then that the sins of those who repent are immediately forgiven? By no means. But he who repents must torture his own soul and be humble in all his deeds and be afflicted with various afflictions. Wow. I mean, that really puts the simplicity of 1 John 1, 9 in perspective. If you confess your sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive your sins. Does it list anything after that? Like, say, 10 Hail Marys or Our Fathers or He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness, right? So you can kind of see the development of, of doctrine and, and how, the, how the church struggled with this. Um, now, of course, you know, if you go to another section of 1 John, it says, no one who abides in him sins. Hmm. Okay, what do we do with that? Um, I'll let Pastor Jeff deal with that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, Hebrews 6 and Reformation Theology. Okay, so now we're fast-forwarding, and 
I mean, we could spend weeks on this stuff. I don't know. It, it can get really boring, actually. Um, and so I've just kind of whittled this down. And if you want resources, you can email me. I can give you some reading on the history of this. But um, Martin Luther in, in the, uh, you know, the Reformation, he kind of sets the tone for uh, a whole series of reformers. And, and one of those is... is um, John Calvin. And so uh, in, in Calvinist tradition, John Calvin um, is the one who really um, systematizes Protestant theology, okay? And he really kind of nails things down. And so if, if you've grown up in a Reformed tradition or Calvinist tradition, um, they have this acronym, which we've talked about actually in this class, um, and does anybody remember what they are? T, total depravity. Um, this one I always forget, actually. Does anybody remember that one? Unconditional election. Limited atonement. Christ only died for those who were saved. He didn't die for everybody. People struggle with that one. Um, irresistible grace. If God is calling you, nothing you can do about it. And last one, perseverance of the saints. Okay. Uh, and so that's kind of the one that, you know, we're having to deal with here. We're having to struggle with. And I had a little quote at the end of last week's um, from John Stott. Many mysteries surround the doctrine of election, and theologians are unwise to systematize it in such a way that no puzzles, enigmas, or loose ends are left. So what happens when you kind of create a box of theology, right? And you systematize it to this degree. Um, when, you, when you have other passages that kind of, you know, don't really fit. Uh, Hebrews 6, 2 Peter 2. Then you kind of tend to ignore those, right? And it's not bad to have systematic theology, but it's better to have it as a framework where you're, you know, wrestling with things and, and, and trying to, to understand, you know, contrary passages. Um, and so, you know, be careful of, of, of lines like that. Um, now, I should probably read this. The final piece to for perseverance of the saints, which was the logical culmination of Reformed theology's emphasis on God's sovereignty and election, where the divine call cannot be resisted and will culminate in glorification. And that's true. If you read that passage there in Romans 8, you know, it starts with the idea of the call of God, and, uh, and it kind of progresses to the idea of the glorification, the final glorification, receiving your resurrected body. And for Paul, that's kind of a given, that a person who believes in Christ is going to be called and God's going to keep you safe through all that. The traditional response to passages such as Hebrews 6 is to conclude that if a person does fall away or reject the faith, then that simply proves that they were not really saved in the first place. Okay? And you can get that out of some of these passages, right? Like even in our Hebrews passage, he says, you know, I'm confident of this, that you will follow things that follow salvation, that, that are consonant with salvation, right? Or in 1 John, you know, if they leave us, well, they never really were part of us. Or Jesus saying, you know, you say, Lord, Lord, but, you know, I don't really know you. Now, there's a Dutch theologian, Jacob Arminius, and I, I think last week in the handout I put Arminius. He's not Armenian. Um, his name's Arminius, but, um, you know, the, the, the modern... He, he, he really reacted against this whole system, even though he grew up Reformed, Dutch Reformed. Um, and he developed a system which, you know, still accepts this. And today, how many of you have grown up like in a Wesleyan tradition, Methodist tradition? Okay. So the Wesleyan tradition, holiness movement, whatever, would be the closest thing to Arminianism today. You know, and we can't really go into that, but, you know, he's, he's focusing on free will versus predestination, right? Free will versus the sovereignty of God. Um, 
So, so I'm going to summarize a few things here. The gravity of the warning in Hebrews 6 must be evaluated in the light of the rhetorical purpose and force of this passage. Despite its severity, the author follows it immediately with a message of assurance that they will indeed persevere and inherit God's promises, right? Even though we speak in this way, beloved, we're confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. Does this mean, as some interpreters suggest, that the situation described is merely hypothetical? Like, this can't happen. That's very attractive. But it's really hard to square that with all of the very serious warnings in this book. It's really hard to square that with the examples he gives of Israel in the Old Testament, turning away from God and being judged. Number two, we should distinguish between a temporary lapse of faith and a permanent condition involving a public repudiation of belief in Christ. In the discussion of the ongoing perpetual priesthood of Jesus, the author assumes that believers will sin after baptism and thus continue to need his mediation. We should not assume that this author would say the same words to those who had left the fellowship and sought to return with penitent hearts. Right? Chapter 7, verse 25. Christ as high priest always lives to intercede for us, right? Very similar to 1 John. While it is important to emphasize the believer's assurance of salvation, and I kind of have to be careful here, (laughs) what I say, I mean, I believe in assurance of salvation. I'm not so crazy about some of the little phrases that people use to emphasize that, which I don't really think are biblical. Eternal security, once saved, always saved, perseverance of the saints. I mean, to early Christians, that would be very arrogant to say things like that because it, it, it diminishes the importance of what we do in the faith. It diminishes the, the connection, the strong connection, even in Paul, between justification and sanctification. Okay? And, and even all the reformers, I mean, they understood that We're not saved by works, but we are saved for works, okay? And so that was really important. And so what happens, if if you just focus on this, right, it it becomes kind of like a barcode Christianity. It's like, well, I got the barcode, you know, zap, you know, I'm going to heaven. Um, It's not really how Paul would, would, would look at it. So... This last part is really the most important part. Um, You can disagree with me on anything. um, But I I really want to emphasize that when we're looking at passages like this, passages in which people have very differences of opinion, um, it sometimes presents a a certain picture of God that people get. And they, they... they form this this picture of who God is from this theology, right? And I think that can be very dangerous. So when we're faced with interpretive issues that might not be clear-cut or could be understood in more than one way, the best way forward is often to fall back onto what we do know for certain. This is especially important when we're dealing with the weighty topic of redemption, salvation, how that relates to the attributes and the nature of God. How does an ambiguous text or selection of proof texts stack up against the full revelation of God's character and his way of dealing with his creation in the biblical story? This is where it's essential to go back to the original self-disclosure of God to humans in the Old Testament, which begins with the revelation of the special divine name, right? So you read Exodus 3, God appears to Moses in a burning bush, right? Take off your shoes for what? This is holy. That's the first revelation, it's the first mention of holiness of God in the Bible in Exodus 3. And then in Exodus 3, 6, he says, well, okay, this is my name, okay? Um, yeah, God's name could be Elohim, but that's one that everybody used, El, right? It just means a creator God. No, this is my special covenant name, which is what? It's Y-H, 
W-H, right? We pronounce it probably Yahweh. And in your Bibles, it's always in caps, right? You know it's this word because it's in capital letters. If it's capital L, small O-R-D, it's Adonai usually, okay? This is God's special covenant name. It's used 6,800 times in the Old Testament. Okay. But then what happens? A little later in Exodus, God reveals more of himself to Moses and, and the people of God there. And so in Exodus 34, God, this is the fullest description of God's character in the whole Bible. Okay. In Exodus 34. What does it come after? Anybody know what happens in Exodus 32? A little golden calf incident, right? I mean, people talk about that like it's like you'd be committing adultery on your wedding night. And now two chapters later, God reveals his character to Israel. The Lord passed before Moses, him, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord. It's the only time we have that doubling of the name in the Bible. A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, this passage then becomes kind of this base text for prophets and writers and psalmists later in the Old Testament. It's used over 30 times or alluded to over 30 times. It's, it's alluded to in the New Testament, right? In, in John chapter 1, Jesus is full of grace and truth. John's alluding to this passage, abounding in love and faithfulness, right? It's the abounding in steadfast love. It's only said of God, okay? That's only said of God. It's not said of any human. And that word for steadfast love, Carla, is what? Chesed. All right, chesed, you had to put like a hard ch there. Um, and it's kind of a combination of love and loyalty, right? Uh, in the New Testament, kind of, it's a really hard word to translate. Um, in the New Testament, in the kind of the Greek, it's, it's kind of a combination of agape and charis, which is the word for grace, okay? Now, what's really fascinating here. Is, I put a few examples here of how this passage then is used later, right? Joel 2. Now we're talking about post-exilic period, right? We're talking about after God has judged Israel, sent them to Babylon. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts, not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. You can see how I color-coded everything so you can kind of see, right? This passage in Joel is actually quoted by Cyprian in this letter to Christians who have, who have denied the faith, okay? Now, it gets even more interesting because Jonah quotes it, okay? And, of course, we know Jonah is supposed to go to the Assyrians and say, and, and preach to them, and they're supposed to repent. And does he want to do that? No, why doesn't he want to do that? Because these Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, right? They're hated enemies of Israel. And he says, I don't want to do that because I knew that you, God, not me, are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. Doggone it. I want them punished. 
We could take it a step further. Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His compassion is over what? All that he has made. Go a few verses later in 16. It says every living thing. Every living thing. God is creator. His character there. So we start out with God revealing himself to Moses in very kind of limited nationalistic covenant relationship. And then we see that relationship expand to outsiders, right? And to the whole of the creation. Um, one of my professors, Richard Bauckham, I have a little quote there from him. Whatever it means for God to visit the iniquity of the parents on their children, God's continuing steadfast love across the generations overflows and exceeds it by far. Probably what is in mind in the latter part of this verse is the way the consequences of sin so easily involve more people than those who commit the sin. Human society being as it is, children suffer from their parents' culpable mistakes and failings. But these effects are limited, perhaps to the generations those parents may actually see. Their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. By contrast, God's steadfast love knows no limits, right? Do you notice the contrast there? Steadfast love to how many generations? A thousand generations, right? Okay, yeah, God's going to judge, but it's going to be limited. And, uh, and I put some other verses there because it, it's not saying that children are going to be punished for their parents' sins. But there is a kind of a generational principle that happens that often what parents do kind of affects other people as well. Um, now, we're in Hebrews. We've kind of gone afield a little bit. But uh, in the very last chapter of Hebrews, the writer uh, closes with an affirmation. He said, uh, speaking of God, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Uh, John, do you want to? We're going to just sing as a closing. I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me no turning back no turning back all right god bless you